All right, YouTube folks, bear with me for just a sec before I get started here. I have to resize things that they so that they don't get covered up by my chat box, which is a struggle, while also trying to make everything somewhat readable. Tricky balance. I suppose it also requires me to like look at my own stream overlay rather than like what I see on Streamlabs. So I've got almost all of them now. What if we delete the word probably here? Shift that over a touch. Does that get me there? Almost. Oop. Hey. There we go. Now it works. And I have a cardboard live deck list that I need to shut off because uh, we're not using a deck list tonight. Shoutouts to Cardboard Live for being awesome, by the way. Love, love, love the support that they are giving me and the rest of the Magic community. Totally hyped that um, deck list coverage at GP G at GPs is going like 100% digital in the coming days, so that everybody will be like. There's, I should rephrase that, so that all the deck lists are easily accessible via Cardboard Live. That's very, very, very exciting to me. All right, so let's go ahead and do this shit thing. Y yeah, like the, the Mythic Invitational was an awesome showcase of what Cardboard Live can do. Um, I did not watch very much of that coverage, you know, I'm basically an all legacy all the time sort of guy. Um, but I'm in some cardboard live chats and, and such. And I watched a couple of clips and, and such. And it was it was cool to see that in action on the, the biggest stage that Magic probably ever had. Anyway, hello, my name's Phil Gallagher. I run Raven University, a site for legacy death and taxes. Today, we're not going to be playing any matches. Today, instead, I'm going to look at 14 cards that have been previewed so far and kind of talk about some implications that some of these cards may or may not actually have for Legacy. Uh, what we're going to do is start our way at the top here and kind of like work our way down the list. So if you tune in later or you're watching this on YouTube later and you want to like find something specific, it is proceeding in this order, which is kind of like from worst to best card. Uh, note that we're not talking about every card that has been spoiled. We're just talking about cards that, like, reasonably people might try to w muck with in Legacy for one reason or another. And let's start with a Planeswalker. Let's start with Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. So, um, at four mana, it's expensive already, so its effects has to be very good. Um, to make a generic statement about a, not a lot of the new Planeswalkers, a lot of them have two abilities, and then some sort of static ability. So this one has like the static ability of if you would draw a card while your library has no card in it, you win the game instead. Which is interesting. So... <laughs> Get your levelers and your thought lashes now, because that's what I'm about to talk about. Alright. So as far as this thing's ability goes, it gets to like Thought Scour, and then the negative eight is draw seven cards, then if your library has no card in it, you, you win the game. Uh, the reason it's phrased like that is just in case the negative eight goes and kills Jace, you still win the game, uh, and you don't like lose it if this thing is bolted in response. So this is a very, very interesting card. And it's kind of similar to other cards we've seen before. Um, Laboratory Maniac being the other one. So Laboratory Maniac is a legacy playable card. Like, you can stop there when you say that. There's a handful of 
degenerate combo decks that occasionally try to cheat that into play and win with it. Um, you know, kind of uh, some of the, the Belcher-style decks where they go all in on the graveyard and then go and reanimate that. This is a little bit more fair than Laboratory Maniac in that, like, you probably just can't cheat this into play on turn one or anything like that. And Blue 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 is a little bit restrictive, too. Uh, there aren't really very many ritual effects that are going to power this out outside of something like High Tide. And if you're high tiding and things are working, you probably have better things to do than this. But what's kind of interesting about this card is that when you consider it together with Laboratory Maniac, you now have eight, you can now play eight copies of this effect. And you can't build a like good legacy deck around like something that there's really only one of in many cases. You want redundancy, you want to be able to find it consistently. So like, let's take a look at one of Legacy's most popular combo decks, right? Show and Tell. So you have roughly eight enablers, plus or minus like one. You have like four Show and Tells to cheat stuff into play, four Sneak Attacks to cheat stuff into play. So you have to have that redundancy in order to make a successful Legacy deck. Well, if you wanted to build around this now, you have eight pieces of both sides of the combo pretty easily. Like you can play four Jace, four Laboratory Maniac, four Leveler, four Thought Lash. Uh, those other two cards are cards that like remove your entire library from the game. And you can potentially build a deck around this. And there are other sorts of effects <laughs> that can go and like contribute to this plan as well. You know, you can enter the infinite, draw all but one of your cards, or, or something like that. Like there's, there's ways to try to abuse this, I think people will try. I think there will be a meme deck list based around this card. But as far as competitive playability, this one's not going to be there, I don't think. Now, are you going to have that one guy that shows up with the shop and like plays some sort of weird blue artifact acceleration remove all my cards deck? Yeah, sure. But... Don't, don't expect to see this one at the top tables of your tournaments. Alright, next up. Nickel Bolas Dragon God. Why do I talk about this one? Well, because it's Nickel Bolas and everyone, like, loves Nickel Bolas irrationally. And, like, people often try to shove cards like this into legacy decks that are very value-focused. Uh, so... Similarly, but with a less restrictive mana cost, we've seen things like Obnixilis see play in the sideboard of like some like Bug or Grixis decks, or occasionally they just want some like over the top value card. And I can see people trying to do the same thing with this card, where like. Uh, I'll shove one in the sideboard, and we'll see how Miracles goes and deals with it when I go and cast this. Like, I can see people playing this as a fun of in their local events, but I don't think this card is powerful enough in order to go and, like, see competitive play. If it was four mana, you know, if this was, like, black, black, blue, red, we'd be, in a, we'd be having a totally, totally different conversation. Uh, note that this card is very objectively powerful, though. Uh, I don't like that you have to, like, minus in order to defend it, and that's a huge, huge deal-breaker for a Planeswalker that's this expensive. But if you're coupling this with other Planeswalkers, then all of a sudden this is like, you know, Nicol Bolas has infinity abilities and can probably do some degenerate things. Uh, the most ridiculous thing I've seen brought up about this card so far is you can go and use it with, like, the bad Jace that makes copies of itself to go and make infinite copies of that Jace. Like, this card's so bad, I don't even know its name. Uh, but there's, like, one Jace who, like, maybe looks, looks like sort of a surfer dude. He can go and, like, make two copies of himself, except they're not legendary. And you can, like, do that to create a whole bunch. Yes, thank you. Jace Cunning Castaway. There we go. I should, like, look at this. All right, so Jace, Cunning, Castaway. 
sexy Jace? Look, to each their own, but I don't know that I'd call this sexy Jace. Like, I'm more of a Jace the Mind Sculptor sort of guy. This looks kind of like farm boy Jace to me. Like, I feel like this is overalls. I know it's not overalls, but that's the vibe I'm getting. Anyway, so the ultimate is create two co tokens that are a copy of this card, except they're not legendary. <laughs> um, so, like, you can, if you have a Nickel Bolas at four loyalty when it goes and enters, after, like, going and plussing once, you go and you get this ability, and herpa derpa derpa derp, you've made infinite duders. And that's kind of neat. But overall, not really a, a legacy contender. All right, so somebody mentioned Nick Fit having a new toy. I think that's actually this card rather than the new Nicole Bolas. <laughs> Will D and T splash blue, black, 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 red to run Nicole Bolas? Preemptively, I think I need to pull up a meme to have it ready. I prepared for this earlier today by putting it as my Facebook profile picture. Just let me download this. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Let's let's preemptively get this ready for the questions as they roll in later tonight. I'm prepared. I mean, I'm not quite as prepared as I intended to be, because I forgot, but I was prepared conceptually earlier. <laughs> I think I remember seeing that Jace art on a Danielle Steele cover. Oh, that's wonderful. <sighs> also, a vial that put Planeswalkers into play would be so fun. I would play the crap out of that card, even if it wasn't good. I'd force it. But it would probably be very good. Alright, anyway, Liliana Dreadhorde General is the sort of card where I looked at it and I went, that's not playable. And then I went, oh god, the Nick Fit players are going to play it. I don't really think it's good there. Let me just, like, start out by saying that. <laughs> um, uh, Whiteface is... I don't know that I saw that card. Do you want to drop a link to that in chat and I'll take a look at it? Anyway, um, when I looked at this card, I immediately thought of cards like Veteran Explorer that you get value when they go and die. So if you have like a Veteran Explorer in play, and you play this, and theoretically you like minus four, you draw a card for your creature dying, you go and you get your two lands, and hopefully you've wiped out like two creatures from the other side of the battlefield. So, neat. But is that really the best thing you can be doing when you're playing six mana? Like, is that better than, like, playing something of, like, Titan quality? I don't think so. But I've already seen some people, like, going and talking about this. And they're saying, like, oh man, it's so sweet, the things that you can do. And I just kind of, like, raise an eyebrow at that and ask myself whether or not that's actually good enough. Alright, so I'll, uh, I'll add that one to the back of the queue. Um, the negative 9 is neat. Each opponent chooses a permanent they control of each permanent type and sacrifice the rest. So it's kind of like a pseudo one-sided cataclysm. And that's cool. But I don't really like the plus of this card. And that's one of the biggest reasons like you go and play a Planeswalker is to try to like grind the value out of the plus. And I also then think if you go and you activate the negative 4, the chances of you being around long enough to get to the negative 9 after that are pretty slim. So I don't think this is a playable card, but I think a couple people will try it out in Nick Fit. And that's been the case for a whole bunch of overcosted green black planeswalkers. Alright, next up, Tezzeret Master of the Bridge. So this card costs 6 mana, which basically makes it Legacy unplayable. But the ability is so cool. So the static ability on this is Creature and Planeswalker spells you cast have affinity for artifacts. 
in any deck that would reasonably play this card, uh, which is basically only like blue-black X Tesserator, that essentially means that any future Tesseret that you would play costs two mana, and it essentially would make just about any artifact you would want to play free for your deck, and that's super powerful. The only reason at all that I mention this card is because of what it can do with something like Ensnaring Bridge. So, like, let's say you have an Ensnaring Bridge in your graveyard. You play this, you minus three, you get back an Ensnaring Bridge. You probably have at least three artifacts, so you can go and, like, play an Ensnaring Bridge, and then all of a sudden this thing is protected. That's very interesting to me. And the negative eight is, is kind of nutty. Exile ten cards, put all artifacts from among them onto the battlefield. Whether or not that's actually good enough, that's an entirely different thing. Um, but it's neat. So, I don't think this card is playable right now, because I don't really think Tesserator is particularly good right now. I think the traditional Tesserator deck of years past that we saw, with like Thopter Foundry, you know, the sword to go with it, a handful of Tesserets, I think that deck has fallen to the wayside because the Antiquities War deck is just, like, better at the same general sort of style of deck. But this is a card, when I looked at it, I kind of paused and went like, huh, that's neat. What do you mean it doesn't get... Oh, man, did I just read this card wrong? Creature and Planeswalker spells you have cast... Ah, I read this card wrong. This card's garbage. Never mind, let's not even talk about this. That one's on me. Oh, that's so disappointing. Alright. Let's chalk this one up to Phil Can't Read. And ignore it from here on out. Let me, uh... Let me remove that one. Whoop. <laughs> but is he D&T playable, though? Probably. <laughs> Alright, <laughs> next up is our friend Fibblethip, or somewhere thereabouts, The Lost. This is another one of those cards where someone might do something stupid with this at some point. So I would feel terrible if I didn't talk about it. Essentially, it's kind of like a a Baleful Strix sort of card, minus the two abilities that make Baleful Strix good. You know, it enters the battlefield, and it draws the, a card. That's cool. If it enters from your library, or is cast from your library, you draw two cards instead. That's good. When it becomes the target of a spell, shuffle it into its owner's library. Notably, it doesn't say spell or ability, so technically, if you have something like a Caracas, you can use this as, like, recursive card draw. And for the low, low price of two mana, and tapping a Caracas every turn, you can draw a card. Okay, but seriously, like, why are we talking about this? <laughs> Is this blue-white D&T playable? Sure, fuck it. Why, why not? Buy all your copies. It'll probably be fine. Alright, um, but in all seriousness, there are some upsides to this card. It gives blue a whole bunch of cantripping creatures. So if for some reason you want to, like, bridge yourself to the later game, or you get something that might power up upon drawing cards, you can have, like, this and Baleful Strix as something that, like, you can go and throw down on turn two. But sort of, like, more interestingly, like, is there a way that this is abusable? And that's possible. It's possible you can go and use something like Experimental Frenzy to cast this from your library. It's possible that you can use this as an intermediate step on, like, say, something like a food chain, 
where you're just looking for something that cantrips to buy you a little bit of time, and then you can use the body for something else later on. Uh, I don't really think this card is degenerate, but there may come a time when someone finds something cute to do with this. Plus, I think it's kind of hilarious that, like, a meme creature got a card in what is, like, maybe one of the most, like, hyped-up sets of quite some time. I mean, we even got a Linkin Park song for, uh, for this set. That's, uh, that's new. Yeah, sure, Birthing Pod is another great example, thank you, where, like, you go and you pull a creature out of your deck directly. So say you go and you, you pod your bird into this, you draw two cards, and then you can go and pod into your Deceiver Exarch, untap your pod, herp -a derp -a derp -a derp You know, you have to be doing something that, like, can enable this guy, but if you're already playing the, the enablers, this, this could slot in somewhere. Like, if someone said a year from now, like, oh, yeah, top it with fibble fifth in my deck. I'd be like, okay, how? But at the same time, I wouldn't really be surprised. <laughs> Maybe it's the key to breaking Frenzy Doomsday. Maybe. Maybe it is. But probably not. Like, the upside of this card, like, working the, not the way it's intended, but, like, the broken way, like, a two-mana draw to is very good. A two-mana draw to on a creature is even better. So, like, if you use this and you go and you chump block a Tarmogoyf or something like that and draw two cards, neat. Like, that's awesome. All right, next up. Sort of an honorary mention card. It's not like... Yeah, Future Sight is another good one that I didn't talk about. So there are a handful of cards like Future Sight that allow you to look at and potentially also play the top card of your library. And when those sorts of things line up with this, that's, that's cool. <laughs> Doesn't look D&T playable at all. This, this is sort of like the next card that's in the history of like Blessed Alliance, Celestial Flare, Wing Shards sorts of cards where like you get not quite Diabolic Edict, because we can never get the nice, like, spells in white. We get, like, the awesome, busted, like, great hate bears, but the spells we get have, like, sucked for years. Like, other than Council's Judgment and, like, maybe Rest in Peace. Not not so much good on the, uh, the old white spells for D&D in quite some numbers of years. Alright, so it says, Target opponent sacrifices a creature that attacked or blocked this turn. So it's not just an edict. It's one that either attacked or blocked. Now, that's different from Blessed Alliance in that if you get to, like, control a Gideon, it gets two creatures instead. Now, that's cool. In a deck like D&T specifically, where you have, like, one or two Gideons, the upside of playing this is pretty low, but people might go and try this out. So, like, let's just, like, comp compare to Blessed Alliance. So, Blessed Alliance, they only sacrifice an attacking creature, but you also get the flexibility of gaining life or untapping creatures, and you also can, like, cast multiple of those with Escalate. So these are two different takes on the same sort of card. There is something that this is like very good for, and that's getting rid of a blocking true name nemesis. That's something that Blessed Alliance cannot do. So like you can go attack in with your Mirror and Crusader or whatever, they'll go and they'll block it, and then you can Gideon's Triumph and go ahead and get rid of that. Here's the issue, though. This is like an edict effect, right? So if they go and block multiple... If they block with multiple creatures, this is something that can probably be played around. Which is unfortunate. 
Now, there are other shells where this might even work better. Like, say you have some sort of stone blade deck that is not in black. You might actually play, like, two Gideons in that shell. And since you have cantrips, you might have a better chance of actually going and hitting the... I don't know what to call it, but like the upgraded version of this where they go and sacrifice two creatures. I'm not sure how important the like sacrificing of that second creature is, but if it always said, you know, one in a white, sack two, that, that'd obviously be broken, right? So this is a card that will probably see some play but it will probably see about as much play as something like Blessed Alliance, maybe a touch more, which is going to be a rare sideboard card, but not something when you see it and you're like, oh man, this was crazy. I never, ever, ever expected to get hit with that. Um, so I have my, my eye on this. Uh, it's probably going to be an awesome combat trick in Limited. Like, this one seems rough, especially if, like, there's some Gideon that non or like lower than rare loyalty. I don't know. I haven't been following the loyalty of the set to like know what he's at. All right. Next up, Vivian's Arcbell. Phil, what are you talking about? Why are you talking about this card? Because there's going to be one deck that's going to try it out, and I should probably do that justice. All right. So this card is a legendary artifact. You pay X and tap it. You discard a card. Look at the top X cards of your library. You may put a creature card with converted mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest on your bottom of the library in a random order. I think that this card might see play in green-based cloud post decks. So a lot of times you go and see these, these decks going and playing things like Primeval Titans, and sometimes even some things smaller than that to, like, buy some time. And then they go into the big Eldrazi. So this is something that you can... <laughs> Fibian's Archbo in the Fibble Fib. Opponent concedes. New Tier 1 Legacy deck, folks. You, hear, you heard it here first from Fat Powder. Anyway, so, like... This is something you can play out in your initial turns that threatens to do something degenerate later on. So why might they want to play this instead of just more copies of, you know, some big fat card? Well, this doesn't cast the card, right? It just puts it onto the battlefield. So if Vivian's Arcbow resolves, then that means all the counter spells, force of wills, spell pierces, whatever, essence scatters, your opponents have on the other side of the table, they don't matter anymore, and this will just dump something onto the battlefield uncounterably. And you might go, well, why would someone go and play this card? That's so much mana to, to get one of those, you know? Six mana, look at the top six, get a Primeval Titan if it's there. Like, shrug. But here's the thing about those Cloud Post decks. When you get to the late game, like... It is not uncommon for them to have access to something like 20 mana, and I'm not actually exaggerating there. Like, they often have enough mana where if they draw an Eye of Ugin, they can go activate the Eye of Ugin and cast an Emrakul or another giant fatty in the same turn. So this kind of falls into that same boat where it can be a mana sink for those decks. Uh, now this this card is like of extremely narrow application, right? Like it can basically only be played in green cloud post decks. It's not really going to have a, a home anywhere else, and it's not going to be good enough to like fit into some other green mid range deck. You know, you're not going to put this in your elves deck. You're not going to put this in your Jun deck or or anything of that nature. All right. Angarth's Rampage is next. Sorry, let me mute that.
I love the cards that they have been printing that look like this, by the way. I know a lot of times, like, people look at these cards and they're like, oh, man, this is clearly built for a best-of-one format. They're going to take away sideboarding. Everything is going to be best-of-one and the sky is falling. I ignore that part of the conversation and I go like, man, that is a sweet card. There have been a lot of cards like this in recent years, like um, Culligan's Command and Dreadbore, where they've kind of like been going hard into the red-black color combination, but giving it a ton of flexibility. So this is target player sacrifices an artifact, a creature, or a planeswalker. Like, just take a minute to appreciate the range. This can answer Chalice, this can answer Jace, this can answer, you know, any creature from Thalia to Thought Not Seer, whatever, at two mana. Admittedly, this is a sorcery, so, like, it's not something that you can necessarily hold up all of the time, but I 100% expect this to see play in Legacy sideboards. I don't know that I'd go so far to say that it's going to make Legacy main decks, since Culligan's Command is probably like the better card to main deck, but I think this is a very nice supplement for a lot of those decks. Uh, so for example, many of those decks might play in a braid <laughs> in in the sideboard, and in many situations this this could be better than something like that. Now, like, there are some issues with this card, since this is a sacrifice effect. You know, if your opponent has Chalice of the Void and Mox Opal or something like that, you know, they get to pick which one they get rid of. So this isn't necessarily a point and shoot, and there are some downsides associated with that. But, um, really the ability to, like, make someone sacrifice a Planeswalker kind of puts this card over the top. I expect to see people mucking around with it. Uh, so Lord, Lord Darkview, essentially what I'm doing is I'm going and working my way down this list. So we're currently on Ungarth, Rampage, and we're kind of working our way up to the cards that are actually good. Where'd my image go? There's my image. So I don't know how much play this will actually end up seeing at the end of the day, since there are other similar effects already. But decks are already playing Dreadbore, and this is not really any further of a stretch in terms of playability than Dreadbore is. Also, of note, this is an uncommon. That's insane. Like... I'm very, very surprised that, like, Power Creep is coming that far. Yeah, so, like, five-second recap. Gideon's Triumph is kind of similar to Blessed Alliance in terms of playability. It can do some different things, since it can, like, go and hit something like True Name Nemesis when it's on the defensive. But it's probably less playable than Blessed Alliance because it lacks the, the flexibility. Yeah, Luinal, that's a that's a great point. You you need planeswalker answers at lower rarities if we're going to have planeswalkers in literally every single pack. Yeah, that's that's something that like I had clearly thought about, but like in terms of the set itself, but it did not I didn't connect the dots in in moment, but you're absolutely right. All right, so next up we get Krenko. So I think the name of this card is Krenko, Boss of Tin Street. Uh, it was uh, it was given a fake name earlier, uh, something along the lines of like Krenko Fabros or something like that, where uh, it was just like playing on Krenko Mob Boss, but just like being cute, just as sort of a placeholder name until we got. Uh, a translation. So this is probably going to see some play, so let's take a look at it. It is a 1-2 for 2 and a red, which is super unimpressive. 
Whenever it attacks, you put a plus one plus one counter on it, and then you create X one one red goblin creature tokens where X is equal to Krenko boss of Tin Street's power. Now, this is <laughs> Scryfall calls it Krenko is forever. That's cute. Alright, so this card is objectively worse than cards like Goblin Rabble Master and Legion Warboss. Just in terms of like the clock that it presents, it's not as good as either one of those. It's also legendary, so you can't just keep dumping copies of this into play. That being said, the flex slot creatures that Red Prison can play right now kind of suck. Like, you see people playing, like, Hanawar Garrison. Or, um, what is it, Captain Lannery Strom? Captain Lannery Storm, one of the, one of the two. And, like, you look at both of those and you're kind of like, eh, I wouldn't be excited to cast that card myself, but I can see where you're coming from. And sometimes they just want something to, like, round out a last deckless slot or two. And I think this card might work better for that than the other options that we have currently. Why? Because it makes goblins. So this card isn't like necessarily great on its own. It goldfishes slower than the other options. But because it has synergy, like let's say, you know, you have a Goblin Rabble Master and this. This will increase your Goblin Rabble Master's damage quite a bit. So this might make it into Red Prison as a one of. I don't know that you can really afford any more than that because you really, really don't want to draw a second of these. Similarly to the other, like, two colors and a red threats, it is a card that can spiral out of control. So, like, the first turn, Cranko becomes a 2-3, and you make two goblins. The second turn, it becomes a 3-4. You make three goblins. So, like, it will still add up quickly. But the legendary downside is a big deal. Like, it will enable opposing Caracases to, to bounce it when you don't have a Blood Moon effect. Uh, that's not amazing. And another thing to notice is that the goblins that are created here do not have haste. And that's another big difference between, like, it and Legion War Boss and Goblin Rabble Master. While that doesn't sound that big of a deal, a lot of times, like, people attack, you know, thinking that they are safe, thinking that their Planeswalker is going to live, and then a 1-1 one -one with haste ruins their plans, or, like, does a point of damage that ends up being very critical later on. So, like, this is not an improvement over the, like, main deck slots of Red Prison, or I should say, like, the core slots of Red Prison, but this may see flex slot play. Uh, note, also, while we're talking about it, that, like, this does give you goblins equal to this card's power. So, if for some reason you had a pump spell or a piece of equipment that would grow its power, you know, this card can hit harder, but there's not really anything of that nature in the deck right now, and you wouldn't really want to, like, add that to the deck in order to, like, increase the power level of this card, so I don't really see it doing any more than, like, the plus one, plus one counter would be doing. Although, I guess you can get cute with, like, a Legion Warboss Mentor trigger, and, like, attack with Warboss and this, put the Krenko trigger on the stack, put the Warboss trigger on the stack, grow the Krenko, resolve Krenko's own counter. Like, okay, I guess there's there's some world where you can get a tiny, like, one-shot bit of value out of that, but it's kind of slim. Alright. Next up is a card I really like in terms of design. I love this card. Alright, Dreadhorde, Anarchist. First of all, it's a red zombie wizard, so that's neat. 
Second of all, its ability is actually really, 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 really good. Um, I expect this card to potentially be a multi-format all-star, and that's, uh, that's strong praise. Whether or not this card will see legacy play, I don't know, but I would be 100% willing to try deck lists with this card in it. Alright, so what does it do? When it attacks, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with CMC less than or equal to its power from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that card would be put in your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. <laughs> I love how they slapped Trample on him for the hell of it. Yeah! Yeah, Magic Historian, I, I, I get where you're coming from there. But I, I think what you've got to consider is that in a limited deck where you get to go and, you know, say, giant growth this sucker, that's very, that's very real, right? So, like, let's say you giant growth it, you attack, you giant growth it again, that's, that's huge, right? All of a sudden you have this seven power idiot, and you've only expended one mana in order to do that. Like, that's neat. So I don't think the trample is just for the hell of it. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Like, if I was drafting this card in like the first year I was drafting, I'd be like, why does this card have trample? You can't trample over something that has zero toughness because it's already dead. So, all right, so I kind of have like two entirely different fronts that I want to look at this card from. Front number one is the combo potential of this card, where, like, you go and you cast some under-costed pump spell, and then you get to cast it again for free. So, for example, in a legacy context, imagine that you invigorate this thing, and then you invigorate it again for free. Or even better, you become immense it and then you become a Memsit for free. Uh, this is a creature that could get stupid, stupid big quickly. Now, is that sort of the equation going to go and see Legacy play? No. No, I, I don't really think so. I think that if people use this, they're going to use it as a card advantage source, sort of along the lines of Dark Confidant. So you play a Dark Confidant, and every turn you get some sort of recurring value from it. I think this has sort of a similar role. It is a little bit more restrictive, though. Like, with Bob, you get everything, right? You know, sometimes there is a great price to be paid for that card, but whatever it is, you, you get it, you get to keep it. With this card, you already have to have, like, something in your graveyard to take advantage of this. But, like, from, like, say, a, like, simple level zero perspective, turn one, you know, bolt one of your creatures. Turn two, play this. Turn three, attack, bolt one of your creatures for free, hit you for one, and then you kind of get to continue this trend, where this can be a very, very powerful control card. Now, what's the cost for playing this? Number one... For, by legacy standards, you probably are only going to be flashing back one CMC cards with this spell. Which is fine, because most of the spells you're going to play in legacy are one man. Number two, you can't really play this with anything else that negatively impacts the graveyard. So you can't really play this alongside cards like, say, Gurmag Angler or Grim Lavamancer in chat is another like good example of that. But I think that this could see play in, like, a blue-red or Grixis shell, or maybe even a Mardu shell, where you go and you fill your deck with one-drops, and then you try to, like, ride this as a primary, not win condition, but sort of, like, enabler to your win, sort of like a, a strong tempo card, like kind of taking on, you know, say, a Delver strategy. 
if you every turn get a free like thought seize lightning bolt path to exile ponder brainstorm or something of that and this card is able to continuously get through like that is a disgusting level of card advantage oh yeah i know i i really don't like the new names but i couldn't remember the old one off the top of my head so it happened that's why i said it with a disgusted tone um i think there might be a little like there might be too much in terms of deck building restrictions for this to actually see a lot of play but this would be a, a card that i would be excited to muck around with i saw a lot of people look at this card and go like man that slots automatically into burn that's so good i don't think that's true i do not i explicitly think this is not a good card for burn because Burn now is playing a lot of cards that aren't CMC1, but they're effectively CMC1. Uh, you know, something like Rift Bolt for Dega. Okay, there we go. Something like Rift Bolt, for example, is technically a CMC3 card, even though it only costs the Burn player a single mana. And those sorts of cards don't work nearly as well with, with this thing. Um... I had a second point I wanted to make. So the, oh, and the, the other one was cards like Spectacle, where again, they go and they cost one red mana, but their CMC is actually higher than one. So I don't think this fits into Burn. But would I be able, would I, would I be willing to try this in like Blue Red Delver, where I can go and play this and have like my eight Lightning Bolt effects, my eight Ponders, or my, my, sorry, my four ponders, my four brainstorms, and maybe a couple of spell pierces, and I can go and, like, flashback all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be totally willing to go and mess around with those cards. Uh, I expect this card to see a lot of play in some formats, uh, and honestly, Vintage might even be a consideration for this card, where you get to go and flashback copies of cards that you normally don't get to flashback. You know, you have one copy of, like, your brainstorms, your ponders, and things of that nature. You know, your, uh, your ancestral, and, like, flashing those back is neat. Probably not worth building around this, this card there, but, like, I would not be surprised to see people messing around with this in decks with, like, Young Pyromancer in Vintage or, or, or something like that where you already want to be casting a whole bunch of, like, cheap or free instants and sorceries. I hope this card sees some legacy play. Like, its effect is very powerful, and its stats are, like, oddly annoying, because, like, as a 1-3, it blocks a lot of creatures from the DNT side of the battlefield, and it also blocks some common, like, ground-based... blah, 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 blah. blah. Ground-based threats... Uh, like, say, Young Pyromancer and Bob, that are our two ones. So, I expect people to mess around with this card. I wouldn't be surprised to see this, like, pop up on, like, a couple of 5-0 deck lists a week or two after the set comes out. I don't know that I have, like, any thoughts about this card, like, realistically taking over the metagame or anything like that. But I think people will mess around with it. Oh, yikes. Uh, this card probably would have been, like, too good with Menace. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, like, one of the things that is going to hold this back is that, like, it might just get checked by opposing creatures. They have to be decent-sized creatures or multiple creatures by legacy standards, but, you know, once a Tarmogoyf is in play or something, this card looks a little silly. I mean, I like a lot of things that are going on in terms of, like, card design for this set. I think the set's going to be very interesting. Noble Hierarch is nice with that card. That's not something that I had considered. Yeah, okay, so for anyone just listening along, Noble Hierarch would be neat with it, because then you could, like, flash back your CMC2 cards. But I think one of the issues with that is a lot of the decks that would want to be, like, in, say, rug colors also might want to play other things that muck with the graveyard, whether that's, like, Snapcaster or Grim Lavamancer or Hooting Mandrels. So I don't know that something like that will actually 
work out. Green and red go really poorly together. Yeah, but maybe you could, uh, you know, play your becomements in this deck, and then they have the reasons to make them go together. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not really convinced. I'm I'm trying here. All right. So now we're getting to the portion of the list where, like, the cards are actually going to be good and see a decent amount of play, or at least have the potential to see a lot of play. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, sometimes as the content producer, you've, you've got to try. You've, uh, you've got to, like, give the card its, its fair discussion, right? So, like, if we look over the things that are in the list so far, like, not going to see play, not going to see play, not going to see play, not going to see play. Eh, you might see it in a deck list every couple of months. You know, same sort of thing. Oh, that will actually probably see some play. Oh, that'll actually probably see some play. Uh, maybe. Now we actually get to the portion of the list and we have like four cards that are like truly, truly discussion worthy and might have some like real impact on the format. Number one, this art is hella sweet. Would be super pleased to own copies of cards that look like that. Super neato. Number two, the effect is actually very, very good. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. If you control a Liliana Planeswalker, each opponent also discards a card. So, this is so crazy good in multiple formats. So, like, number one, if you're, like, a commander player, like, how happy are you right now? Each opponent sacrifices a creature at two mana? Holy cow. And if you have a Liliana Planeswalker, which, you know, you probably do if you're in black in that format, like, neato, the amount of value you can get is insane, right? Like, get three creatures, get three cards, get a six for one at two mana. Like, whoa. That's like, that's like so dirty. So the immediate comparison that needs to be made for this card for our purposes is to Diabolic Edict. So let's look at wording very, very carefully here. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. If you control a Liliana Planeswalker, each opponent also discards a card. So I think a lot of people looked at this and they compared it to Diabolic Edict. Now, this is different, right? This says target player sacrifices a creature. So number one, this targets. So Diabolic Edict can like have its target changed, or you can also cast Diabolic Edict targeting yourself. Well, when do either one of these things come up? All right, it is not totally unreasonable for your opponent to have something that can change the target of a spell. Um, like, every once in a while you'll see someone get cheeky and play, like, a Divert or something like that as a one-of in their deck. So, while that's not going to come up, but, you know, one in every 2,000 games or something like that, it is something that can occur. <laughs> as with all edge cases, we need to talk about my favorite boy, Nick Fit, over here. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, misdirect is, is another good one. Alright, but in all seriousness, sometimes you do want to make yourself sacrifice your own creatures. In Nickfit, you want to make yourself sacrifice your veteran explorers, or every once in a while you need to make yourself sacrifice some other creature in order to, like, get the backside of a Thrag Tusk, or to, like, go and put a counter on, oh, what's his name, the green-black guy that gets stuff back from your graveyards, Marin, I think it is? Marin something something tooth Nell. Yeah. Whatever whatever that card's name is. Marin of Clan Nell Toth. Sure. We'll go with that. Thank you, Kiki Jiki. So, like, there are times where this edict mode is going to be relevant. Um I forget where I saw it. I don't remember if it was one in one of the group chats or like on Reddit, but someone was talking about a time where a DNT player was it, it was like reanimator versus DNT or something like that. And, like, a, a DNT player was trying to, like, flicker-wisp a Jailer. And if the 
it must not have been Reanimator. It must have been something like a Thief of Sanity deck. And if the player had targeted themselves with Edict in order to get rid of the Jailer, they wouldn't the the D and T player wouldn't have gotten the Jailer back and then become the Monarch. So like there are going to be fringe scenarios where like the target player sacrifices a creature versus target opponent sacrifices a creature matters. But generally speaking, Liliana's Triumph is going to be an upgrade over Diabolic Edict. And I expect to see a lot of this card seeing play in Legacy. Specifically because a lot of the decks that would play this are also going to play one, if not both, of the Lilianas. So if you take something like Grixis Control, or maybe a Bug Control deck, like, they need Edicts as answers to Merit Lodges, and they're also playing Lilianas, so this is just huge upside. Now, you're not going to be enabling the, like, second half of this card before turn four, in all likelihood, but in the, like, mid to late game, that is relevant text. You know, especially if you're trying to, like, get someone hellbent with Lily of the Veil, vale, you know, plus make them discard a card, Lily's Triumph, get a creature, make them discard another card, like, that can be huge in trying to, like, eat away at a buffer that someone has in their hand. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about this card is that if you are trying to power out a Liliana early, like, say, in Pox, this card's stupid, right? Like, if your plan is to go Dark Ritual and a Liliana on turn one, and then you can follow up on, like, turn two or three with this ahead of Curve, like, that is a disgusting amount of value. Like, two mana for an Edict, already fine. Two mana for an Edict and discarding a card, insane. Uh, I saw a cute video on Facebook today of someone, like, taking out their, like, foreign, I think they were, like, signed uh, Diabolic Edicts out of their, uh, their, their deck of cards and just, like, throwing them into the garbage. I don't think it's quite that far, but this is largely going to replace Diabolic Edict in lists. Yeah, I, okay, I should mention that. As far as not targeting goes, can I pull that back up? Do I have to click over here to pull that back up? Hey, yeah. So as far as not targeting goes, sometimes with something like Leovold, where like the Edict would target them and this does not, you can save yourself a card. And if your opponent has something stupid that like gives them hex proof, like say a Leyline or um, Witchbane Orb or something like that, this gets around that. My Lingering Souls. He's an Arcanist, not an Anarchist. I'm going to check myself here. Oh, he is an Arcanist. That makes a lot more sense in terms of lore and why he's like flashing back spells. Arcanist. Thank you for that, because I probably would have like called that card wrong for a month. I spent uh, most of my lunch hour putting together this uh, spreadsheet of things that I wanted to talk about, and I got kind of rushed. I made some errors. Chat just sitting there all quiet, letting me make mistakes. Scumbag chat. It's okay, I love you anyway. Alright. Now... We get a cool card. I was legitimately excited about this card when I saw it. I was very happy that my name also wasn't Bryant Cook when uh, this was spoiled. Because I'm sure that like every like Storm-ish player was hitting him up going like, Hey, how do we use this card? Um, I can add that to the queue at the end if you want to talk about it. I haven't really looked at that card much. I have not talked about anything that is not on that list, except for a Tezzeret card that I thought was way better than it was. Alright, so, Bolas' Citadel. 
It's six mana, which should be too restrictive by legacy standpoints in normal situations. But in a degenerate combo deck, six mana is not overly limiting, right? If you look at something like Storm, you know, one of their primary win conditions, or I should say like two of their primary cards are at five mana, right? Like you have Ad Nauseum and you also have Dark Petition. And you also need way more than six mana in order to like actually go and win. So if you consider that this is like three lands plus one like Cabal Ritual with Threshold away from just like being cast, like that's not actually all that bad. So, uh, you can look at the top card of your library at any time. You may play the top card of your library. If you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to its converted mana cost rather than pay its mana cost. Now, I know what you're all thinking, and it was the first thing I thought too. Fibble thip combo. Pay one life, draw two cards. Unbeatable, right? Yes. But let's move past that. <laughs> um, I think that there is a very good chance that this could be a card that enables a new, maybe Storm or Pseudo Storm deck. Where you can go and really power through your deck. So, like, theoretically, you want to build your deck in a way so that if you put this card into play, you're, like, let's say, greater than 75% chance to win the game on the spot. In order to do that, you need to not keep hitting lands, though, which is tricky. So you might want to build your deck in a way that minimizes the number of lands in it, you know, playing one land in land grants, for example. Or you might need some ways to go and shuffle your library or something like that so that you can keep churning through spells. This is conceptually similar to something like Experimental Frenzy, where if you go and put it in play and you're a combo deck, you can get huge amounts of value out of it. So, for example, like the, the mono-red bonus round deck played Experimental Frenzy and then played a whole bunch of cards off the top of its library. This is going to have a similar effect. I think that the sacrifice 10 non-land permanents, each opponent loses 10 life, I think that's irrelevant text for Legacy. You know, you want to be using this as a combo enabler, and I don't think you're using this as a finisher. I think some other card becomes your, your finisher. Um, I don't know what that card is, necessarily. Uh, it might just be Tendrils of Agony, or, or something like that, or it could be some other finish. I don't want to go and talk too much about this card, because Brian Cook wrote a great article discussing some of the things that you can go and do with this card, and like some of the advantages and disadvantages of like this versus like ad nauseum. So, um, so since you just got here, essentially I'm working my way down this list, and I'll kind of like leave this list here from time to time so people can go and, and look at it. Yeah, so Inquisitor, I think you could very easily build a Belcher-style deck around this card that may even like use something like Belcher as a, a finisher. So, like, with Belcher, you want to get to 7 mana in order to finish, right? Like, you want 4 for Goblin Char Belcher, you then want, like, 3 to go and, like, activate it. You might be able to build a literal Black Belcher deck, and it might play, like, Belcher a bunch of rituals, this, and then, like, maybe it's in another color or two as well. You know, like, maybe it's in green for land grant, and then also red for some other rituals, and maybe even, like, empty the warrens or something like that as a backup. 
or it might even just be able to like tendrils. I don't, I don't know exactly, but oh, this is also not an S apostrophe. It is an apostrophe S. Bolasils. So I think that card has a lot of potential, but I think it might require building an entirely new deck around it. You know, it's like kind of like Experimental Frenzy. It took people a little while to kind of figure out what they should do with that card, but then it ended up being a totally playable legacy card and even just like got slotted into various places where like maybe it didn't seem intuitive at first, uh, like as a sideboard card in lands, for example. Um, but I'm excited to see what that card is going to do. Uh, is Dread Horde Invasion just really a bad Bitter Blossom? Yes, I, I believe that is accurate. I, I don't see that card seeing any legacy play. Uh, like, one of the biggest benefits of Bitter Blossom specifically is that you get to go wide of a lot of decks. Like, you get to, like, create so many creatures that they can't keep up with it. You know, you make a stream of attackers or a stream of chump blockers, and I'm just, like, not excited about, like, growing a zombie by one every turn and losing a life. Um, that just doesn't feel good enough by, uh, by legacy standards to me. Actually, I should just, like, pull up that card real quick just to, like, flash that on the screen. So, if you haven't seen this one, it's one in a black enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose a life and amass one. In other words, if you don't have a zombie yet, you create a 0-0 zero, zero black zombie token, and then you put a, a counter on it. And then every turn, you can, like, put a counter on that zombie. Now, it also has the text of whenever a zombie token you control with power 6 or greater attacks, it gains lifelink until end of turn, but, like, how are you getting to that in Legacy Standards? Like, if you haven't killed them with this card by now, like, you're probably doing something wrong. Right? Like, the rest of your deck isn't supplementing it. And, like, if you get to this point, is the lifelink actually going to matter? <laughs> probably not. I don't... I don't see that card as doing anything. Yeah, so Monkeys Can't Cry. I just finished talking about Bolas' Citadel, but since you brought up, like, a second point, I didn't talk about that. So, like, we talked about, like, a one-land Belcher-style deck with Bolas' Citadel, but I didn't talk about Tutors. And you're you're totally right that, like, something like Enlightened Tutor or Limb Duel's Vault that can go and stack the top card of your library is just nutty with this card. Like, if you play this card, you go and you cast a Tutor, you know, maybe off at the top of your library even, that goes and puts something on top of your library, then you can go and really just, like, chain value together again and again and again. And I really like that approach. Um, I know I'm, like, doing a legacy-focused thing as well, but I do wonder if, like, that card even has, like, vintage potential. Uh, you know, in Vintage, you have a whole bunch of, like, cards that are singularly busted, basically on their own, like Tinker, and going and, like, pulling those off the top of your deck seems neat, or, like, using it as a way to assemble, like, Vault Key, or even just, like, outgrind a bunch of blue decks that are just, like, ah, my mental misstep will be enough, not if I just keep playing ones into it until you run out of them. Sure, if we can just take the other side of that equation, too, you can also just tinker for this card, and maybe it will win you the game. Sure, but, like, most of the time when you tinker for something, it's just gonna kill people. You know, my experience is usually just tinkering for Blightsteel. But, you know, it's an artifact. It does have that upside. I wonder if in Vintage you could actually get to, like, ten permanents that you could reasonably sacrifice in order to drain for ten. You, like, you might be able to with, like, Moxen or Mentor tokens or something like that. It's not, like, the craziest thing in the world that something like that can happen. Or we can just get the memory jar off the Tinker. Yeah, Tinker's, tinker's busted. That card's great. It's, uh, it's probably a good thing that we don't have that in, in Legacy anymore. All right. So next up, we get... The Karn Father. 
All right. So this card is hot. I'm really sad that this is like the highest resolution image we have right now, uh, but it is what it is. All right. So it's four mana. Number one, that's great because that means it's a turn two play in a lot of these double soul land decks. Number two, like the abilities are actually good. So its static ability that it has is that activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. So no ether vials, no equipments, no random other artifacts that you have, just no. Now that ability isn't strong against legacy decks as a whole. <coughs> But against a few very specific decks, it is crippling. So, you're playing against Storm. You play this, hey, goodbye to your LEDs and your Lotus Petals, as well as any other artifact mana you have. So if you're playing something like Chrome Mox, nope, it's gone. You're playing against a, a Mox Diamond deck, like, uh, like Loam or something like that. It shuts those off. That's huge. So even when this isn't like a lights out punch, and it's like, oh, you're playing against Steel Stomping, and you just shut off their Ballistas and their uh, Steel Overseers and all their mana. Like, even when it's not going to be like that good, there's the potential that like the static ability of this card alone takes over a game. <laughs> Mycosynth Lattice is now a forty dollar card thanks to that. Lol, indeed. Lol, indeed. So, like, we haven't even gotten to the plus or the minuses of this card yet. And that's where I think things get cool. So the plus. Until your next turn, up to one target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness equal to its converted mana cost. So what does this do? Number one, you can use this to hit your opponent with your artifacts. I think that is the obvious use of this card. Oh, I have an Ensnaring Bridge, I'll plus my Ensnaring Bridge now attacks you. Neat. Number two, you can... <laughs> I can punch you with my vials! It's what I've always wanted to do. Turn my vials sideways when I couldn't already, like, use them. Neato. Alright, number two, you can use this to kill your opponent's stuff, right? So, like, let's say your opponent has a Chalice of the Void plus on their Chalice of the Void, it is a non-creature artifact with CMC 0, and it goes and kills them. You know what I mean. I was just trying to think of something that doesn't have a CMC of 0. Fine, let's attack with Sorceress Spyglass instead. Kappa indeed. Yeah, but like, you can turn many of your lock pieces, like say a Trinisphere, into something that deals damage. That's attack with Jitte. I'm gonna read Umazawa's Jitte real quick. I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get counters by attacking with the Jitte, but like, I just wanna check. I've never tried to attack with a Jitte before. Yeah, whenever equipped creature deals combat damage. That is unfortunate. Alright, so the plus is good. Equip Jitte onto a batter skull. Alright. <laughs> Alright. So bear with two guns. The static ability says acti activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. So if we have our own Jitte, it's still totally fine. We can plus turn our Jitte into a creature, equip it with our batter skull, and go to town. Equipments that are creatures can't be equipped and fall off when they turn into creatures. Oh, you're talking about opponents. I see. Yeah, the, the meme value here is strong. All right, but the in all seriousness, the the best ability on this card is probably the minus two. So you may choose an artifact card you own from outside the game or an exile, reveal that card, and add it to your hand. This is degenerate. You get to tutor 
for your best silver bullet hate cards with a card that you can very reasonably play as a four of in your deck, since it's both like a tutor, a hate card, and a win condition all in one. This is very powerful. So you can go and tutor up your Tormod's Crypt, your Chalice of the Void, your Trinosphere, whatever narrow hate card you have access to, you can go and get that. So, I'm not going to say that, like, we're going to live in the magical Christmas land, like, where you get to go and tutor this up and turn everything into artifacts, and then, like, uh, n none of your opponent's cards can activate abilities anymore. Like, I, I don't think we need to, like, necessarily go that deep in order to power up this card, because I think just playing regular power level cards will be totally fine with this. I think this card will see a lot of legacy play, and I'm comfortable saying that. It also may end up changing some archetypes or reviving some archetypes a little bit. So, like, you may see this slot into something like Red Prison. You may see decks like Mud coming back. Because, like, now they can play four Karns and four other Karns, in addition to the stuff that they were they were doing before. Uh, you may also see this, like, as another alternative finisher in a deck like the Antiquity Wars. So, I, I think this card potentially has multiple homes, and it's very, very, very powerful. Uh, it may also change sideboards a little bit, and we might start to see some things see a little bit more play. Like, we might see, like, some Sorceress Spyglasses or some Damping Spheres or or something like that in sideboards that, like, maybe some of these decks wouldn't have been playing before. Yeah, like, th this card is powerful, right? So, like, of all of the, the meme cards so far, this is the first one where if someone said, like, is this DNT playable? For the first time, I might pause and go, like, well, maybe, but probably not. Like, I like this card so much better in a deck that can play it on turn two or turn three consistently. But, like, having access to sideboard cards in game one is pretty good. Oh yes, this card's very good against DNT. Like, disgustingly good against DNT. Like, this static ability alone is pretty crippling. Yeah, like, no no Roger Things has always made me cry. Um now, there's another really cool thing about this that I haven't talked about yet, because it's like super, super deep. But Serum Powder, right? So if you Serum Powder and you throw away an initial opening hand, those cards go into exile, right? Well, this gets a card from outside the game, which, you know, we think of as our sideboard, or in exile. So you can fish cards out of exile that you put there with Serum Powder. Ooh! Well, that's totally cute, Phil. I really like that. You know what else synergizes with this? More other Karn, or more other other Karn. Both the other cards named Karn end up like exiling cards, right? You can use those cards to enable this Karn. Uh, so... What's the name of the 4-mana Karn? The other 4-mana Karn. Um, not liberated. Karn Scion of Usa. Alright, Urza. That. So, you can use Karn Scion of Urza to, like, put some cards into exile, and normally you have to, like, minus to fish those out, but you can grab it with this one instead. Ah, it was here. 
You can pair it with a rest in peace in order to grab anything at all, because it all goes to the exile zone. Yeah, that's super cute, but like we probably don't need to go that deep, right? Um, but this this card is very powerful. I like this card a lot. Uh, it goes into the style of decks that I enjoy, and it is going to randomly win games on its own for the static ability. Like, if you get paired against D&T, and you can flop this on the board, and it's not just going to immediately die, like, the value you'll generate off this is insane. Against Storm, this is like a win condition and a hate card in one, which is exactly where you want to be. And against other equipment-based decks like Stoneblade, um, this can really put a damper on some of their primary plans. You know, the plan of, like, you know, grind out your creatures with Jitte or something like that isn't going to be as good. Now... This this card has a lot going for it. Yeah, Kiki Jiki, like, five starting loyalty up to six if you plus is very, very good at a rate of poor mana. You know, when we compare it to something like Jace, for example, like, you know, we're, we're feeling pretty good here. Um, that being said, like, it, it doesn't take away all the aspects of equipment-based decks, because if you still just, like, Stoneforge for Batter Skull, like, you... You, like that, none of that is going to be the activated ability of an artifact, right? Like it's not going to stop the the four four by itself. All right, I think that's all I want to say about that card. Uh, I'm very excited for this one. I I think this card is great. Uh, there's going to be some fun brewing to be had around this card. All right, we're going to get to that, but a couple people in chat went and suggested a couple other cards to talk about. And I want to talk about this one last, because we're probably going to talk about this one for a while. You can kill the Batter Skull Drone with Karn. Yeah, so I guess you can, like... I guess you can plus on the Batter Skull turning it into a 5-5, causing the germ to become unequipped, and then, like, it falls off. Yeah. So, like, I guess you can answer a batter skull, kind of. But, like, your opponent can then, like, bounce it, and you're in a weird sub-game. Or, no, they can't bounce it because of the Karn. Yeah, alright. Like, maybe it's fine against batter skull. I mean, obviously it's fine, but maybe it's, like, actively good against batter skull. Alright, so someone suggested a Nick Fit toy here. I think it was White Faces. All right. Storev Devkarin Lich. 5-4 Trampler for 4 mana. Decent rate. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player or Planeswalker, return to your hand target creature or Planeswalker card that wasn't put there this combat. Um... So, Awkward Eternal Witness for Nick Fit. That gets bounced by Caracas. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about this one. Like, it's very similar to, like, Marin in terms of design, but Marin is probably better. This is, I guess, a better threat on its own. And, like, Marin sometimes takes a while to get degenerate. I'm not excited about this one. Like, I don't look at this and go, like, ah, that's clearly slotting in. <laughs> Obviously not going to be a legacy staple since the name is too hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though objectively it's probably not that good, but I'm still stuck in a world where a 5-4 trample for 4 is insane, and not only is there no downside, there's an upside. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like, if you evaluate this in terms of, like, limited size, a 5-4 four for 4 with, with uh, like, multiple upside abilities, like, that, that is nuts. And, like, even look, like, the, the first card that comes up in comparison is Marin. So, 
like, just to, like, compare it a little bit more to Marin. Like, you get a card back to your hand every turn, even if this thing isn't attacking. And the upside of it being put on the battlefield is huge, but it takes multiple turns, like sometimes three or four, in order for you to, like, realistically be bringing things back and playing it every turn. So, like, you're, you're looking at a 3-4 versus a 5-4 for similar effects. This one's slightly harder to cast. Um, which is sometimes relevant in Nickfit because you have some basics. Um, so, like, I wouldn't be surprised if people tried this, but I wouldn't be overly scared of this card. Alright, uh, someone else brought up this card. I have to read this one. I don't actually know what this one does. Alright. Nahib, Dreadhorde Champion. Two red red. I'm already not sold. 5-4 with Trample. Well, as we just saw, that's a decent size. Legendary, some downside, Caracas. All right. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, you may discard any number of cards. If you do, draw that many cards and add that much red. Until end of turn, you don't lose mana as steps and phases end. So... I don't see this being legacy playable. It's four mana. It's just a creature. It's not a creature that ends a game. It's not a creature that gives you an insurmountable ability if it goes and connects. And I don't know what card would actually want this. Yeah, no, not even haste. Like, to, to make a comparison, like, off the top of my head, I can think of, like, two four mana red creatures that see play. One is P and K. Like, Pia and Kirin Noir, which is, like, three bodies in one, so it's obnoxious for control to answer. If you're playing it, you're sometimes playing it with Caracas so that you can recur it, or you're playing it ahead of schedule on, like, turn three with Ancient Tomb. It also has a hugely relevant ability that guns down the small creatures of, of Legacy. And, then like, the, the other one that, like, I see seeing play at four mana is Hazareth which is like a 5-4 with haste, with an ability that helps to enable it attacking, and it's also indestructible, so it's obnoxious to get rid of. Like, I don't think this is better than other finishers that we already have in red. Yeah, it's Captain QC, that's another good comparison. Like, if you're looking for finishers in like a red Chalice and Trinosphere deck, like, the Planeswalkers are better options than this. P and K is better. The even just like the Rabble Masters and the Legion War bosses are like as a whole at a much better rate than this. Yeah, also very bad with bridge out. That's a, another like great, great obvious point. Yeah, I don't uh I don't see this one working. Alright. So we have one one left to talk about. But, like, this is going to last a little while. So, before I do that, <laughs> Hazaret is a 10 turn clock with Bridge Out. Yep. You, you got us there. Alright. Um, so, before I, I talk about Teferi, I want to take a second and do a quick ad read. Uh, I have someone who wanted to, like, go and sponsor the, uh, the stream for a little while. Uh, so I want to go and, like, pull up their site, show it off, and do a, a quick ad read. Oh, they have a waifu delivery service now. Well, that's interesting. All right, so this is sponsored content. I want to make that clear before we start here. Uh, so this stream is brought to you in part by my friends over at underdoge.com. That is U-N-D-E-R-D-O-G-E.com, as in the meme. Uh, so this is a website that is looking to go and help you find new streamers to watch. So they have a streamer of the day function where they go and they highlight someone that you can go and watch on Twitch. Uh, their idea is that you can go and find someone to watch because like let's be real there's a whole bunch of people streaming on twitch and you don't necessarily want to go through and waste your time on watching something that's not interesting so they kind of go and 
look over a bunch of streamers for you, and then they sort of like sponsor some of them for a day and give them a huge shout out. So the site is looking to sort of like host and increase coverage, or not coverage, like increase accessibility to good streamers. Uh, so it looks like Waifu Delivery Service is the, uh, the streamer of the day there, which is a hilarious name, and I'm all about that. Uh, so the site was just started by a bunch of people who, like, go and love video games. Apparently two of the three people are actually dogs. Oh, no, sorry, all three of them are dogs. My bad there. Um, so if you are looking for ways to go and find new streamers, Underdoge is a great site to go and check out. Again, that is underdoge.com. Uh, I was a featured streamer of the day on them one time, and they are paying me for this plug. And sponsored content. Alright, we have a Vivian card to talk about. Alright, let's look at that real quick. Then we'll, then we'll talk about the big baddie that has been blowing up my group chat all day. Alright, you may cast creature spells as though they had flash. Eh. Until your next turn, up to one target creature gains vigilance and reach. Eh. Look at the top three cards of your library. Exile one face down and put the rest on your bottom of your library in any order. For as long as it remains exiled, you may look at that card and you may cast it if it's a creature. That's, like, a terrible card. I don't know why people are freaking out about that. Like, yes, it's a three-mana Planeswalker, but, like, you don't care about the Flash that much that you'd want to go and play that. I have no idea why the Maverick Discord would be freaking out about that. I, I, don't, I don't get it, Captain QC. I really don't. Alright, last card of the night. Teferi, Time Raveler. Not Time Traveler, but Time Raveler. Uh, this is probably the most interesting card in the set in terms of design, and nobody agrees on how good this card is. I, I'm a part of a huge number of Facebook chats and such, and everyone keeps going back and forth what they think about this card. Some people think it is like the most degenerate thing ever, other people think like this is totally overrated and it's not going to see play for more than a couple of weeks after the card comes out. And I understand everyone's opinion on this card, because this is, I think, a very hard to evaluate card, and I think we're going to have to see this one in play to see how it really warps games. So. Like, let's, let, let's talk about the abilities, and then we'll kind of, like, talk about what people want to do, and, like, why they want to be playing this card. So, its static ability is each opponent can cast spells only at any time they can cast a sorcery. So, no countering your stuff if this is out. No end-of-turn terminus or swords to plowshares or whatever. The plus is until your next turn cast sorceries as if they had flash. That's kind of whatever, right? Like, instant speed ponder is cool and all. Instant speed hardcast terminus is cool and all, but, like, this isn't the biggest of deals. The minus three is pretty good. Return up to one target artifact, creature, or enchantment to its owner's hand, and then draw a card. So, essentially, when people look at this card, they, they tend to say one of two things. Thing A, they say, is, this is insane in Miracles. Thing B, they say, is, this is insane against Miracles. And, the, like, those are entirely different things, but, like, the discussion of this deck is entirely focusing... Or sorry, the discussion around this card is largely geared around Miracles. Essentially, if this is on the board, like, you are free from a Miracles player. No Snapcaster being flashed in to go and, like, ambush Viper you. No Source of Plowshares removing your stuff. They can't counter your spells, disrupt your combo, do, do whatever. Like, you say no to everything that they go and do. And that is incredible. Some people are saying that decks that currently don't run white should go and splash this card. So there are people who are saying you should take a deck like Ant or Sneak and Show and splash white for this. Because if this card resolves and sticks around, you get to go and just win the game against those blue base decks. There is no stopping you. No, no Trixies. 
uh, a lot of obvious comparisons are made to si uh, to like City of Solitude. Oh, thank you for whoever linked that already, so I don't, didn't have to go and pull that up. So City of Solitude reads, players can cast spells and activate abilities only during their own turns. But it's better than that because this is one-sided, right? So you still get to do stuff on your opponent's turn, and they don't. <laughs> yeah, insane with and against blue cards. Yep, that's a, that's a great way to look at Legacy. What might... Let me phrase that. The plus of this card is very medium, in my opinion. Like, this is not better than the plus of many other Planeswalkers in Legacy. However, the minus is strong. The minus can let you take just about any problem off of the battlefield, albeit temporarily. So, this is a card that can hose a Miracles or another control player, while also answering just about anything, right? Answer a 3-ball, answer a Chalice, bounce a Thalia, get rid of stupid enchantment that, like, that one enchantress player that shows up to your local event is playing that, like, you can't possibly beat. This is a lot of utility on a card. So, like, let's, let's start by talking the in-miracles takes on this card. In miracles, you essentially gain the ability to play a bunch of your cantrips at instant speed that you normally couldn't. So your like your your big ones, I guess, are like your your cantrips, your ponders, your preordains, and your your like portents can be played at instant speed now. You also will have a couple of like flex slots, like um, say a council's judgment or something like that that you could play at instant speed, and that's all neat. The issue is that, like, this card doesn't protect itself long-term, right? So, like, say there's a Thought Knots here on the battlefield. Bounce it. It'll come back. This doesn't permanently answer anything, which is huge. And it can't, like, answer something multiple turns in a row either, right? Like, say you play this and immediately bounce something, you can't just bounce it again on the following turn. And I think not protecting itself is a very, very big deal. Now, that's not necessarily a deal breaker, but, like, what do you cut for this? You, don't, you can't, like, cut something like a Council's Judgment from your deck, I don't think, because this isn't a permanent answer to those sorts of cards. It's a temporary answer, but I don't know how I feel about that. And, like, let's say you get, like, the dream scenario of, like, oh, the coast is clear on the other side. I'll curve to ferry into Jace. So now you have two planeswalkers that can't permanently protect themselves together? Like, you can only minus so many times and, and keep up with the other side of the board. So I'm not necessarily convinced that this card is like the greatest thing since sliced bread in miracles. Uh, Honorog, I think, is pretty excited about this card and really, really, really wants to try it out. But I'm not convinced that this is something that like miracles needs to build around or anything of, of that nature. Yeah, e exactly, Kiki Jiki. Like, what do you take out to play this? Are you, are you shaving your cantrips? Are you shaving a business spell? Miracles doesn't even have that many business spells right now. Like, there's a lot of error in that deck. Like, whether, whether or not you're on, like, AKs or... Uh... Wow, blanking on a card name here. Uh, two, two mana predict. There we go. Uh, like... Whether, regardless of which one of those you're on, like, you can only shave so much, right? So, like, I don't know, like, what you would cut for this and whether or not, like, this would be a change that would be significantly better. So, like, I'm not, I'm not convinced this is, like, a great card in Miracles. It's probably fine, but, 
Like, to be honest, at least with my style of playing Miracles, I'd rather just, like, for three mana, I want to play a Mentor. Like, Mentor wins a game. This card does not win a game. This card might make you not lose a game. This card might, like, increase your chances of having the flexibility to win games, but, like, there's no ultimate here. There's no way that this card wins you a game, just, like, literally. So, I don't... I don't know that I'm on board with this from the Miracles perspective. So let's talk about, like, the anti-Miracles perspective. That is, like, do you play this card against a, a Miracles deck or another control deck and just win the game? Some of those decks don't actually have all that many creatures, and so they can't pressure this effectively. And so the answer might be yes. But for a spell, spell-based blue combo deck, is this going to be worth like a spending three mana on it, and b splashing in order to make it work? And I'm not sure that the answer is yes. So consider show and tell. At three mana, you can win the game. You can cast show and tell. You can win the game. Cool. That sounds good. Let's do that. This does not win the game. It might put you into posi a position where you are very likely to win, but there's already plenty of other effects that can do this, right? So you can go and play something like City of Traders, Xantiv Swarm, uh, Overmaster, or even to a lesser extent, a lot of times something like a Flusterstorm can win some of these fights for way less mana. So, I, I'm not convinced. And, like, let's, let's say we take something like Ant. Is, is this worth, you know, bastardizing your mana base in order to play this card? I don't know that the, the answer is yes. Like, I, Ant can play out some of these long games, so, like, taking a turn off to play something like this is, is probably fine. But, ugh, like, I, I'm just not convinced that it's worth it. Like, how do you fit, like, say, two white lands into your deck to do this? Like, how are you going to fit, like, a Tundra and, like, maybe a Scrubland into your deck to go and support something like this? Like, I, I, I don't see it. So, I am of the... <sighs> Chat's telling me about how I should put this into d and I am of the opinion that this card is currently overhyped. I do think the card is good. I do think the card will see play. And I do think the card will see play week one. But I don't think that this is like the format warping card that some people think it is. Like, okay, so who, who said that? Captain QC. Yeah, like... In something like the Miracles Mirror, this is crazy good, right? Like, the ability to really limit your opponent's options while increasing your own options is great there in a game that's, like, very, very likely to go extremely long. Like, I, I think, like, a Miracles Mirror is a great situation where this card is just going to be nuts. Um... But I don't, I don't think this card is going to live up to the level of hype that it has currently. And that's kind of where, where I stand on this. Like, there, there are some people who very, very strongly and vocally disagree with me on that one. Uh, like, Marcus, uh, you know, High Tide Marcus, is, is of the opinion that, like, this, this card is very, very good. And is going to see a lot of play. And it's going to be, like, very, very good in, like, the blue mirrors. But, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, like... I'm not sold on a card that can't win the game. I'm not I'm not sold on a planeswalker that doesn't actively protect itself while plussing or staying at the same loyalty. And I I don't know, like I'm just not excited about this this card. <laughs> yeah, Marcus is a great great player. So Kind of like, of the cards that we're seeing so far, 
And, like, we're still pretty far away from the fo full spoiler, so, like, there's still some stuff that are left. Of, of the cards, like, from Angarth's Rampage down, we're, we're talking about cards that might reasonably see some legacy play. From Liliana's Triumph down, those are the cards that will see some degree of legacy play. Yeah, like, we, we still have some big fancy Planeswalkers who have yet to be be revealed. And even some of, like, the, like, fringe Planeswalkers that are just going to be, like, uncommons or something like that, if they have weird and narrow abilities, they could still see legacy play. Or if they're under-costed at, like, three mana or something like that and provide decent utility a couple of times, you know, we we might see that. Okay, all right. For the, for the meme, I guess we, like, actually have to look at the new Gideon, right? I, I completely ignored that because it's terrible. But, alright. Let's do it. Let's get this on here. Oh, oh, it's covered up everything. Oh, oh geez, how do we fix it? How do we... Oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe we can never look at the Gideon. That'd be a shame. Alright, uh, so in all seriousness, so new Gideon at 3 mana. If it's your turn, it's a 4-4 four, four human soldier creature token, or creature with indestructible. That's still a planeswalker. You prevent all damage that would be dealt to it during your turn. You plus up to one other target creature you control gains Vigilance, Life, Link, or Indestructible. You get negative six to exile target non-land permanent. So this is a 4-4 four, four that's indestructible, uh, an indestructible creature on your turn, but on your opponent's turn, they can attack and kill it. It can't even give itself Vigilance, Life, Link, or Indestructible. That has to go to something else. So essentially, on your turn, it's a 3-mana, three, 4-4, three 4, 4, indestructible duder that just, like, probably turns sideways. It has a negative ability that it's probably never going to get to because it has to, like, plus twice and not die. Like, this card's so bad by legacy standards. Like, this is noticeably worse than, like, getting an ally of Zendikar. And I have no idea why some... Well, okay, it's not that I have no idea. Like, it costs three mana, and it's a Planeswalker, and it's white. So, like, that's why people are saying, like, oh, we can slap this into TNT. But, like, it doesn't work with Bile. It has negative synergy with Thalia, which is, like, the turn two play that you want to take an overwhelming majority of the time. Like, it's, it's sad. This is amazing, and it all Gideon's deck. Yeah, in RBS, like, that's another good point. Like, he's just going to get plowed, or he's going to get dismembered, or he's going to get attacked. Like, there's so many ways that this guy is just, like, going down. <laughs> it's basically White Liliana the Veil, or Last Hope. Uh, sure. We'll, we'll go with that. Yeah, like, this, this, this card... It's, eh. it's, 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 it's no good for us. Like, it's an aggressive card, but d and is not an aggressive deck, right? Like, if there was just a 3-mana 4-4 four, four indestructible, would we play that? Wouldn't be excited about it. I would, I would like the upside of something like Mirren Crusader potentially much more than that. And, like, this is just, like, worse than that. I, I, blah. Blah. That's, all I have to, uh, that's all I have to say about this card. Alright, so that's kind of the end of all the cards that I wanted to walk through. Does anyone have any questions about any of these cards, or is there anything that I missed that you want to talk about? Yeah, and the, the Gideon also has, like, negative synergy with the equipment, right? Like, equipping every turn. Eh. <laughs> I think Wendigo's got, like, the best point. Like, if you want to play, like, some for funsies all Gideon deck, like, cool. You get another Gideon to add to your all Gideon deck. <sighs> Karn's Bastion. Let me look at that card. I mean, I really like Dreadhorde Anarchist. Sorry. Or, sorry, Arcanist, not Anarchist. I got that one wrong earlier. 
I, I think Dread, uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist is very, very good. Uh, when I originally wrote this out, I described it as a multi-format all-star. I, uh, I'm very much on board with that. Oh no, I've sorted this by date. I need to undo that. So it's going to be at like the very bottom. That is a land, right? Karin's Bastion. Alright. Four tap proliferate. Um, not sold. I don't really know what this does. Like, this is way too slow for something like Infect to want as a finisher. Like, if Infect is at five lands and they haven't won the game, this is probably not going to be the difference between winning and losing. Like, you know, you can technically, like, make it a crop rotation target or something and, like, try to finish off people with this, but... Uh, like, in a Wasteland format, I don't see something like this as being powerful enough. Oh, it looks like there's different art versions of this. That's neat. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what this is doing. Yeah, and if you're, like, trying to use this as anti-chalice tech, uh, as in, like, the two-mana card where you can sacrifice an artifact and proliferate, like, two-mana... To do that is like neat, cute, and maybe even good, but five total mana in order to do that, like four plus Karn's Bastion, like that's that's too slow. Yeah, I'm I'm not seeing that working. Yeah, but uh, bear bear with two guns, like this card. Like, if I were going to brew for an event and try to play a deck that no one has ever seen before and, like, get people, there's two cards from the set. There's three cards from the set, like, you, I would consider play, playing around. The new Karn, Dread, uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist, and Bolas' Citadel. I personally would put my work here because it favors the sorts of decks that I play, and I'd be most comfortable, like, tweaking something. But I think this card has huge potential. Yeah, I misread the six mana Tezzeret card. I thought that one gave your artifacts affinity for artifacts when I first read it, because I'm dumb. And then I thought it was good, because you could like get your ensnaring bridges back for free, and then I realized I'm stupid. Yeah, there's there's no love for uncounterable negate. Well, we'll we'll keep that to other formats. Our uh, our counter spells are are leaner than that. Yeah, Tesserators basically like disappeared off the map though, right? Like I used to occasionally play against Tesserator, but like these days, most of the people who enjoy that strategy are just on the Antiquities War deck since it just gets people dead quicker. Whew. All right. Well, that was like two hours of talking about spoilers, so I'm, I'm worn down. I'm going to go ahead and uh, call it a night here. No, I think Maverick gets more play than Tezzerator. I think Maverick gets some love. I think Tezzeret is like shoved into the corner, and it's dark there and scary. So I'm going to be back on Saturday. Uh, I got a donation for a Blue-White Rebels deck list, uh, so that, that'll be a fun. I will probably get beaten to death in some leagues, but... Uh, well, we'll see what degenerate thing we can we can try to do there and see if it'll at least be some fun. Uh, so if you enjoyed the content, please consider following. I'm doing legacy content three days a week here on this channel. And if you really enjoy this, please consider doing something to support me financially, uh, whether that's subscribing to the channel or doing a donation deck list. Uh, I think I'm two deck lists towards my next donation goal, which is going to be doing a longer Saturday, Saturday stream where I try to do more than one league. All right, let's see who's streaming that I can turn you over to. Looks like Arkin's streaming, so I'll go ahead and host him. Good night, folks.